ability to work in their chosen profession, uh, pursuing their American dream. And so what Sandy did was she teamed up with other folks, uh, other flower sellers, and the Institute for Justice in a lawsuit to sue um, against this, uh, this regulation. And um, what we said was that she had a constitutional right to earn an honest living in the field of her choice. And nobody could really believe that the flower selling law was there to protect some sort of health and safety concern. Everyone knows that this law was enacted to protect a politically connected group from competition, from people like Sandy. Well, what happened was actually tragic. Um, the lawsuit ended up getting mooted because of Hurricane Katrina, but um, the government actually threw Sandy out of work because she didn't have this license. She was thrown out of work and she ended up being unemployed. Uh, she got sick and she didn't have any money. She ended up not being able to pay her rent and uh, she had to go in and get surgery. And the last time our attorney saw her, she was you know, all stapled up and laying on her couch and it was just sweltering heat outside. She couldn't pay her air conditioning and she actually ended up dying uh, alone and unemployed and broken. And, uh, and it was so needless. Um, you know, she was just doing what she, she wanted to be doing. And if this bad law wasn't on the books, this unconstitutional law, then, uh, you know, then things would have turned out different. But um, the bottom line is that if, if this was an isolated incident, it would be one thing. But, um, but these kind of laws are all over the country, they, uh, from coast to coast. In, um, for example, in 1981, there were about 80 uh, licenses, 80 uh, jobs in the United States where you had to get the government's permission to do them. Uh, today there's well over a thousand. Um, and this is happening all over the country. This isn't some weird Louisiana thing. Okay, I guess we're done with it. Sorry about that. There was some static. Um, these kind of laws are all over the country. Uh, for example, we have, a, we have a lawsuit right now in Philadelphia um, where it's illegal to, uh, to talk about the Liberty Bell for money without permission from the government. Um, unlicensed tour guides are being subject to hundreds of dollars in fines and for talking about the place where the Declaration of Independence was written. In, uh, in Texas, uh, we have a lawsuit where eyebrow threaders are getting hit with $2,000 fines. And government officials are, are expecting eyebrow threaders to, uh, with up to 20 years of experience, to uh, immediately stop working and spend about $20,000 obtaining 1,500 hours of instruction from government-approved beauty schools that don't even teach threading. Uh, we had a case in Maryland recently where a woman was threatened with thousands of dollars in fines and criminal prosecution unless she stopped massaging horses. Uh, apparently, this is a growing field, and uh, the state's vet cartel thought that they would cash in on it. They got a law passed that said that only veterinarians could work in this growing field of animal massage, which is basically like saying only licensed medical doctors can give you a foot rub. All right, so this is ridiculous, and this is happening all over the country. And so the question is, why? What happened? Why is this stuff going on? Uh, there's a few reasons, but I can tell you one is just a basic lack of knowledge, a knowledge that this is going on, and a knowledge of um, principles of economics and how a society should be structured. And another thing is, is we've just sort of gotten used to turning to the government to, to get special privileges, to put our competitors out of work, to protect us from crimes and concerns real and imagined. And, uh, and we'll talk about that today. Um, a third point that we won't get into too much, but that IJ deals with, is the notion of judicial abdication. And that is that our rights are not protected because our judges fail to protect them. Uh, courts have decided that certain rights, like your right to earn a living, aren't as important as other rights. And less important rights in their eyes are not subject to meaningful judicial scrutiny and are rarely afforded real protection. Um, so what can be done? Well, to combat the lack of knowledge, there needs to be education, of course, um, amongst ourselves and others. And uh, to combat this sort of shifting turn to the government, we need to shift the public opinion and the public attitudes about how our society should be structured. And to uh, change the judicial abdication, we need judges that are engaged. And what we mean by that is judges that actually judge, judges that don't throw a uh, that allow unconstitutional laws to stay on the books or kick them over to the legislature. 
Um, but it's hard. For, for several decades, the, uh, the courts have basically been abdicating on their responsibility uh, to the point that we had a lawsuit. We were representing, a, a, it was basically a casket cartel that we were fighting and, um, and went up to a federal circuit court and everyone knows, knew that this law had nothing to do with protecting consumers and everything to do with protecting this powerful cartel. And yet the court issued a ruling that said this, while baseball may be the national pastime of the citizenry, dishing out special economic benefits to certain in-state industries remains the favored pastime of state and local governments. That's, uh, that's pretty brutal. But that's what we're facing today. So IJ fights back. Uh, for the last 20 years, we've been litigating for liberty. We are the nation's leading legal experts uh, and the nation's leading legal defenders of liberty. We sue the government. We go into state and federal courts throughout the country defending your rights, your right to economic liberty, your right to private property and free speech and school choice. We've had several cases. We have victories all over the country in state and local, uh, state and federal courts, and we've had several Supreme Court victories. In fact, we are going to be um, back at the Supreme Court on Monday. We're teaming up with the Goldwater Institute in a big free speech lawsuit. Uh, but our biggest lawsuit that we have was actually one that went to Supreme Court and we lost, and that's the Kelo case. And in that case, the government said in a five to four ruling that the government can, uh, that it's okay for the government to take your property, your home, your business, and hand it over to a private developer to, who can bulldoze it so long as that he promises to generate more tax revenue with the land. And so you tend to think that Kilo was a failure, but we fight all of our cases in two courts, the court of law and the court of public opinion. And after the Kilo ruling, there was an absolute explosion of outrage that occurred throughout the country. Countless editorials and opinion leaders adopted our terms of debate, talking about the issue from our terms. Typically, when uh, the Supreme Court issues a ruling, state courts will, uh, will follow suit but not necessarily the case with Kelo. Nine state high courts have rejected the Kelo doctrine. Forty-three state legislatures have um, issued laws that have restricted the powers of eminent domain in their territories. Forty-four grassroots victories have occurred at eminent domain at the grassroots level, and 88 percent of people in the public now believe that property rights are as important as free speech and freedom of religion. So by that measurement, you could say that Kelo was a success because we fight it in two courts, the court of law and the court of public opinion. So the Kelo lesson is that you can overcome adversity by making use of the court of public opinion. And if you can use the court of public opinion to your advantage, you can advance your cause, whatever it is that you're fighting for. The power of public opinion is immense. Uh, Thomas Jefferson famously said that the force of public opinion cannot be resisted when permitted freely to be expressed the agitation it produces must be submitted to, right? And we see that. It's not hard to see where that's happening. Um, public opinion is powerful. So, so why deal with the media? Well, I can tell you the most important reason to deal with, with the media is because the media can do a tremendous job of helping you to achieve success. Uh, if you are able to use the media, your job, if you're going to be interacting with the media, is to set and define the terms of debate from the very beginning. Define what's going on, whatever it is that you may be doing. Uh, if, you're on your, if you're on your campus and, uh, and you're trying to influence folks, then uh, what you can do is uh, make use of the media to, uh, to help advance your cause. Uh, maybe you want to show the consequences of some bad laws or um, hold certain people accountable. And when you shine the media spotlight on people, it's amazing uh, what can happen. Ultimately, you can build public support for your case like we did with Kilo and sway public opinion. And once you get public opinion on your side, you can absolutely achieve success. Another important thing with the media is that you can find allies. Uh, we have uh, all sorts of folks that we've found through, through the media that have come and help at the grassroots level, help at the legal level. Um, and just different types of non-traditional alliances. For example, uh, we, have, we had a recent case in Washington, D.C., where um, we teamed up with one of the top uh, progressive bloggers. We, uh, we sent him an email and said, hey, we'd love to meet with you. We have a case we think you'd be interested in. Uh, his name's Matty Glacius. You may know him. And uh, we sat down and had lunch with him, me and uh, the attorney leading the case, Bob McNamara. And we talked to him for an hour, and just a wonderful guy. And the day that we uh, filed the lawsuit, he had a wonderful piece that he put up. Um, I've linked to it in my slideshow, so it, you know if you get the slideshow after, you can uh, 
check it out uh, or just click on the link. But basically, the day we launches it, he says, you know, the Institute for Justice shares my interest. Sure seems like a bad policy to me. Barriers to entry that are bad. Customers are protected by the marketplace, right? Now, this is one of the top progressive bloggers for the Center for American Progress. And we work with him in a wonderful piece. And we do this all the time with uh, whether they're libertarian or progressive or conservative or whoever they may be. You can work with all different types of people um, across the political and ideological spectrum to, uh, to advance uh, what you want to do. Now, there are five qualities that are essential to being an effective spokesperson. And when, when we have our spokespeople, our attorneys come in, we always uh, go through all of these with them and they exemplify them well. Uh, and they are, as you see, being accurate, timely, positive, thorough, and open. And these apply whether you want to interact with the media or whether you're out trying to get your dream job and you're interacting with uh, folks um, at different jobs where you're doing interviews. You have to be accurate, timely, positive, thorough, and open. So what I mean by accurate is always be truthful. Uh, reporters will take your information and make it their own. And so if you end up giving, now the thing is, is of course we know that we want to be truthful, but you can get really worked up when you're involved in something, and there might be a tendency to want to embellish, but absolutely resist that. Because reporters do take your information and they make it their own. And if you give them something that's not entirely accurate and they run with it, then uh, they get burned, and then your relationship with the reporter is ruined. But not only that, but Student for Liberty's uh, relationship with that paper gets burned, and then Students for Liberty or whatever group you're affiliated with ends up being in trouble. So absolutely make sure that you're always accurate. And uh, in terms of applying for a job, make sure that you, uh, that you don't embellish, don't, uh, don't talk, about, talk yourself up too much, but at the same point, don't sell yourself short. Don't say things like, well, I'm not that great, or what have you, and don't use jargon, just simple, honest, direct language. Uh, obviously important to be timely. Uh, respect deadlines. The media is extremely deadline driven, especially now that the industry is changing so much. The, uh, the traditional media outlets are just crushed with, uh, you know, they've been consolidating and they have super, super busy, so absolutely respect their deadlines. And the social media, the new media world, uh, most of the folks have full-time jobs separate from it. So, you know, even power bloggers like, say, Instapundit, you know, he's doing stuff besides blogging. And so, be very um, aware of their deadlines and be respectful of them. When you're going in to apply for a job, timeliness is important too. When you show up for an interview, it's good to be early, but not too early. Let's say you have a two o'clock uh, interview scheduled. You know, it's good to show up maybe 1.50 or 155, but don't show up at 135 because uh, it's too early and uh, people are doing it a lot lately and all it does is make a bad first impression. It's important to be positive. Uh, focus on solutions. Everyone seems to like to complain about all the different problems in the world, regardless of what their political leanings may be. But people don't like to work with that, and it gets annoying after a while. Uh, so be pleasant, and you'll find that you'll be much more productive if you're pleasant and you focus on solutions. At IJ, we call ourselves the happy warriors, and, uh, and, and that's what we are. Dale Carnegie famously said that any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, and most fools do. So, uh, so don't be like that. Um, I'm going to skip this, uh, this Bob Hoover. Hey, uh, another hey, Bob. Sorry, sorry? For the, hey, Bob, sorry for the interruption. Uh, we just wanted to let you know that the slides aren't changing. Um, I'm not sure if you could try to switch to the next one or if it's a problem with the screen, if it's frozen or what's going on. Okay. Um, does, does this help if I, could do the, if I do this? Yep. We can, we can, I can see it now. It says okay. thorough. Okay. Okay. Thanks okay. so much. Sure. So, so being thorough is obviously... Um, one of the things we were talking about, uh, to provide reporters everything that they need. Um, and uh, we provide one-stop shopping documents. The reporters are busy, and the more that you can give them, the greater the chances that they will uh, run with your story if they don't have to do a ton of uh, research on their own. Uh, so part of being thorough is building a detailed list of different people that you meet. When you're starting out and you're trying to do stuff on campus, you may not know who the right person is to meet with. But um, as you learn who those people are, keep them down in an Excel spreadsheet or something and build that detailed list and, and make use of it over time. When you're out applying for a job, do your research beforehand. Know the company, know the people that work at the company, and know the position that you're applying for. Um, and have thorough answers. Don't just say, you know, yes, yes or no. Be able to answer and practice, 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 whether you're interacting with the media or people um, that you're trying to uh, get a job with. Make sure that you, uh, that, that you practice well. Uh, 
let's see if I can find where we were. Okay. Another is, and lastly, uh, is to be open. A palms up. We say you, you are. We, we are who we are. You have nothing to hide. So when you're out um, interacting with the media or doing a job interview, uh, just be who you are. It is important, though, when you're interacting with the media, to stay on point and to be professional. Uh, you don't want to, um, let's say you're in a job interview, you don't want to talk about, say, politics or religion. You don't want to uh, say anything about, say, going out and partying or anything like that. Uh, stay on point, stay professional. We like to say, be like the NAACP. In 1934, they launched, uh, they were open about saying that they were going to end segregation in public schools. And they launched a uh, campaign, the Court of Law and the Court of Public Opinion. And despite all of the precedent against them and all of the adversity in the public, 20 years later they actually succeeded in, uh, in doing that. And, uh, and they got one of the most influential Supreme Court rulings by being open and uh, fighting in two courts, court of law and court of public opinion. Now communicating by, what we always say is with communicating is storytelling. You want to have stories that you share with the media. We say you have to earn your PhD in, uh, in media relations. And by that, we mean personalize, humanize, and dramatize um, everything. So by personalize, what we mean is reach the right person the right way. Uh, instead of just blasting out stuff to a whole bunch of people, what you want to do is find the right person, the person that's interested in the story. If you're doing a sports story, you know, don't pitch everyone at the paper. Find the sports guy that would be interested in it. Because people aren't inter interested in what you want. They're interested in what they want. So find out what they want and then find a way to give it to them. Um, I'll give you an example of this. Here's an email that I sent last week to uh, the booking agent for the, uh, the Hannity Show, which is a very popular national TV uh, network show. And uh, if you notice in the subject line here, the most important line in an email is the subject line. You know, it says Jenny. I have her name there so she knows this isn't just a, a spam email. And it's a short, catchy subject line. It's not that long. So I want her to open the email. And then when she starts reading it, I'm talking in her interest, right? Hannity has been great about doing this. And I say, your viewers in particular will be interested in this story. It's about her interests and what she wants. And, uh, and she ended up writing me back saying, great, you know, we're going to do them. And so, uh, and, and they are. They're going to do two network features on, uh, on the two uh, pitches that I gave them. And they should run within the week. So make sure that you personalize your, uh, your pitches. By humanize, we mean tell real stories about real people. Uh, it's not about some arcane licensing law in Louisiana. It's about Sandy Meadows. By dramatize, we mean identify and share outrageous facts that have big impacts. And don't be afraid to use numbers. Uh, for example, like the numbers I gave you earlier. In 1981, there were about 80 occupations that uh, you needed government's permission to do. Now there's well over 1,000. Right? Don't be afraid to use numbers, and graphs work well, too. Uh, media expectations. What the media expect are brief statements taken from the heart, a couple of points that you want understood. Now, you might talk to a reporter for, say, 20 minutes or 30 minutes or more, but realize that you're only going to get uh, one or maybe two quotes uh, in the paper or in the TV or whatever the outlet is. So figure out in advance what you want those quotes to be. What do you want to get across? What are the two points that you really want to make sure everyone knows about? Um, and then use and review your talking points often. Um, you review them when you're at the bar, you know, conversing with people, or when you're, uh, you know, walking to class or whatever it may be. You know, really hone that message. Uh, you know, it could be more than two. You might have a handful, but really figure out what they are and make use of them. We call them SACOs, which stands for Strategic Overriding Communications Objectives. Rhymes with SHACO and uh, hopefully has that sort of effect. You want to have your SACOs ingrained in your brain and use them often. A few examples, uh, we documented over 10,000 examples of imminent domain abuse in just a five-year period. Notice the numbers, the dramatic numbers there. Um, that SACO got picked up probably over 10,000 times in different outlets since that report came out. I love this bottom one here. There's no reason to require a license to sell what is just a wooden box. That got picked up all over. We recently filed a casket lawsuit uh, challenging a law similar to the uh, flower one where there's just a bad law in the books that's protecting these casket makers. And our point of setting the terms of debate was to say, if you watch this video, uh, this TV piece came out the day we launched the case. And, uh, and if you watch Taco in there, we have our attorney saying it's just a box. We have our clients saying it's just a box. And we even have the report.
supporters saying it's just a box is Leah would say we dominated. Um, a great place to go to visit a bunch of Sakos would be uh, right here on our IJ uh, YouTube page. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different channels here that you can click on and, uh, and see the way that our attorneys uh, talk in our talking points and, uh, and make good use of our Sakos. So I encourage you to check those out. Of course, we're not the only ones that use Sakos. The uh, Students for Liberty did a great job. They were Sako machines on national TV a few weeks ago. Uh, this was Peric Please and Michelle from, from SFL that absolutely kicked butt on national TV. I encourage you to watch this. They, they exemplified the effective spokesperson to a T. They, uh, they spoke in their SACOs. They didn't keep rambling. They stopped when they were done. They were polite. They were courteous. They're smiling and eye contact. You can see just a case study and uh, an effective um, SACO delivery. So I encourage you to watch that one again if you haven't uh, already. A few nuts and bolts. Um, different types of things that you can use to, uh, to reach out to the media and just the public at large. Uh, we find, of course, videos are probably the best for you guys. Uh, videos are great because they personalize, humanize, and dramatize probably better than anything else you can do. Um, there are things like advisories and releases and op-eds and letters, and I won't go too much into that, but I can say if you're going to have an event, it's nice to send out like a one-page advisory that's just the who, what, when, where, why of what's going on and include your contact information and links. A release announces something that has just happened or is about to happen, and you want to keep them short and really targeted. Uh, include links in them, um, and uh, and you know they can be uh, useful. Put them up on your website as well. An op-ed stands for um, opposite the editorial. It's an opinion piece that you write, and you could put it in a paper or you can put it in a uh, online outlets. Now there's a bunch. And I encourage you guys to uh, to write to write articles, write op-eds. Uh, it's good to sort of just take them. Take your SACOs, your talking points, and, and put them into the op-ed, string them together, and, uh, and make sure that you're humanizing to the extent that you can. Talk about real people in your pieces if you can. A letter to the editor is a little different. It's a, you actually respond to something that was in a paper, and it's shorter, about 100 words or so, and you want to make just basically one point. Blogs are huge now. I encourage you to develop relationships with bloggers and, and pitch them regularly on things that they're interested in. One of the most important things that you can do is create your own coverage. And this is something that's unique, that's, that it's new. Um, you, uh, what we've done recently is we've gotten um, passwords into all sorts of big outlets. And now we have um, our president is a writer for Forbes, and we write for the Huffington Post and the Daily Caller and big government and town hall. So we can regularly create our own coverage. I would highly encourage you guys to get involved in your campus papers and other blogs, whether they're national or local. and. Uh, and basically become become reporters, and uh, and cover events, uh, and set your own terms of debate that way. In terms of interacting with reporters, the best way is definitely face to face. To the extent that you can do it, I highly recommend it. Whether it's going to a meeting somewhere or um, bringing them to your place, I, I like to take them. I like to invite them to the office, show them around, introduce them to people, and take them out to lunch. Um, phone calls and emails, of course, are sort of the bread and butter. Uh, if you're making a pitch by phone call. You want to ask two questions up front. You want to say, are you on deadline? And do you mind if I give you a 30-second pitch on a story that I think you in particular would be interested in? And hold yourself to that. Actually, you know, record yourself. Make sure that you've got a 30-second pitch down. Um, texting and IM are, are very useful tools. I wouldn't recommend starting your pitch that way. But once you've developed a relationship with people, it's a great way to stay in contact. For example, Reason Magazine does a lot of stuff through GChat. Uh, most of the conversations and pitches and such I do with Reason Magazine is through GChat. Um, five essential techniques. Uh, I won't go into great detail here, but I'd recommend, I'll just sort of do a quick overview. Um, you guys have probably all read the law. And if there's one book that we could say that everyone's read uh, in the Student for Liberty movement, it's probably the law. And if I say, where did you get the law, you may say, well, I got it from you know, Clark Grouper, or I got it from IHS. But you actually have to go back a little bit further. and. Uh, this actually came about from a guy named Thomas Hicks and Carver. Back in the 1940s, um, Frederick Bastiat was basically lost to history, and there was a guy giving a speech out west who had become sort of recently converted to the libertarian philosophy. He was very passionate about it, and this old economics professor, Thomas Hicks and Carver, uh, listened to him talk. And here's Carver. Oh, that's not Carver. There we go. Uh, Carver uh, actually said, um, goes up to the guy and says, after the talk, he says. You look, you sound like Frederic Bastiat, and the guy said, "Who's Frederic Bastiat?" And that was basically all it took. And the guy ended up um, becoming super into Bastiat and the libertarian 
philosophy in general, and ended up starting an organization a couple years later called the Foundation for Economic Education. And one of the things that he did was um, he published lots of copies of the law, and he, they've been doing it ever since. And, uh, and IHS and other folks get them from fee, and now um, as a result of that, uh, over a million copies of the law have been, uh, have been printed. And so the, the lesson here is, uh, is to be sociable and attend events and share your thoughts and realize that you'll never fully know your impact because um, there's no way that Carver could have known by just simply talking to this guy who's with, with Leonard Reed that, uh, that Reed would go on and become this super Bastia champion. So, um, so make sure that you, uh, that you go out and you're interacting with people. Um, I want to... I, want to make sure that I don't take too much time, so I um, want to bring up this point about Larry Reed. I, uh, I worked at FEE a, uh, a few years ago before IJ, and um, Larry Reed is the current president of FEE, but when I was there, he, uh, he wasn't the president, but he came in to give a speech, and there's about 150 people there, and he comes in, and I'm sure he's super busy, and he's got the speech to worry about, and he's interacting with some folks, and he gives his talk. And then afterwards, he's interacting with some folks. And then my job was to drive him to uh, to his hotel. And when we're walk, I go, I pull the car up uh, up here in this drive, and we're sort of parked here. And I go in and I get him. And there's all these people sort of milling around outside. And as we're walking out, Larry Reed says bye to everyone by name. Now I'd been working there for a year, and I didn't know everybody's name. And it just sort of blew my mind that that he was able to do that with everything else going on in his life and I talked to him about it and I said how you know how could how did he do that when we were driving to the hotel and he said well the memory book but um, he said that remember that it's that people love to know that you know who they are and remembering someone's name is one of the most important things you can do and listening to people is one of the most important things you can do people love to talk and sometimes when we're in conversations we like to talk more, you know, wait until someone's done talking so we can add our point, but it's really important to listen and to give people the feeling of importance of, um, of remembering their names. And it's extremely important when interacting with the media and when you're going out and trying to, uh, to get your dream job. So the lesson is to be a good mem uh, listener and to, uh, to remember people's names. Uh, Bertrand Russell is uh, one of my favorite sort of folks from history, and uh, he had a whole bunch of insights that are worth uh, checking out, but one of them was, I don't know if you can see this here, but one of them was that um, he understood that humans by nature are biased, and we tend to accept things that are, uh, we tend to accept things as true if they coincide with our beliefs and reject things if they don't coincide with our beliefs, regardless of whether or not they're actually true. And the lesson here is that there's all sorts of people out there that have different ideas, and when you want to go out and influence people, you have to understand that. You have to understand that we are all biased and the people that you're interacting with probably don't agree with everything that you think. And so if you want to win them to your way of thinking, you have to understand that and think in their terms. And realize as a libertarian that you're in the minority. Uh, you're the weird one. We're, we're we're the weird ones, and so we have to uh, we have to understand that and uh, realize that uh, that we need to be understanding and think of and talk in terms of other people's interests. I want to make uh, one last point here about um, actually my brother here, a guy on the right there is my brother Scott, and uh, and I'm the guy in the green helmet there. And about a year after college, I uh, found myself back at home working this uh, basically pyramid scheme job. And after about nine months, I realized, like, what the heck am I doing? This is terrible. And so I called him up and I said, Sky, I'm, I got this like terrible job, man. Uh, what can I do about this? And I tried to get another job. I tried for a few weeks to apply. I didn't, nothing panned out. And so and he'd sort of, you know, top of his class in high school and college, great job right out of the gates. So he said, don't worry about it. Go to the library and get this book and read it. And then, uh, and then talk to me about it afterwards. And, uh, and this was a book, it was called What Kells Your Parachute. And after a week of reading this and applying it, I had two job offers. And one of them was my dream job out at the Foundation for Economic Education. And so uh, I think that was you know, very important. I'm glad that uh, he gave me that advice, otherwise maybe I'd still be working at the pyramid scheme. Uh, sort of corollary to that principle, we were out on a hike once in the, uh, in, down in the Grand Canyon. And if you notice, he wore, uh, 
white t-shirt that covered himself up, and I wore the probably absolute worst thing you could possibly wear, which is a black muscle shirt. Uh, and so I'm, I'm totally exposed to the sun. And if you're going to spend about 15 hours hiking in the sun, you probably don't want to wear a, a black muscle shirt. And so uh, about eight hours in, I started to get sick. And um, and so being the nice brother that he was, he ended up exchanging shirts with me, so he got stuck with this terrible thing. And by the time we came out, I was okay, but he had actually gotten sun poisoning and it was really sick. But thankfully, uh, we both survived. And uh, and if he didn't do that, maybe I'd still be I'd be floating around the Colorado River or something. But the point here is that is that prepare for success and go after your dream job, whatever it may be, and uh, be willing to uh, to make sacrifices to help um, other folks you know around you to uh, succeed whoever they may be, folks uh, that are in the Students for Liberty movement or folks that you know or just someone that comes along maybe interested in something, you know, be willing to help them out. Um, it's important. So these are basically the, uh, the Ten Commandments of uh, effective media relationships or effective uh, job hunting techniques is to be accurate and timely and positive, thorough and open and to be sociable and just generally nice and to be a good listener, to understand other people. And, uh, and to be prepared. And I also want to point out that there's two pillars that all of these rest on, and that are to always focus on building yourself and building relationships. And what I mean by building yourself is that excellence is attractive. Uh, and that's a really important point to understand. Excellence is attractive. It's attractive to employers, of course, uh, if you're really good, but I'm actually talking about spreading ideas. For example, who do you think could sell more basketballs? Someone who learned a bunch of sales tricks or LeBron James? By the same token, um, who do you think could do a better job of selling the ideas of liberty? Someone who's learned a bunch of sales tricks or someone who's fundamentally mastered an understanding of the freedom philosophy? Right? I mean, the question answers itself. Become excellent at the things that you love to do and the things that you want to learn and the things that you want to share with others. Excellence by nature is attractive, and it's through the power of attraction that ideas are spread. So become excellent. And in terms of building relationships, this is vital, of course, to success in media relations, building relationships with reporters and bloggers and people on campus and people in different groups and throughout the community and beyond. Um, and as for landing your dream job, of course, the more people that you know, the better. Uh, but at this fundamental level, relationships are just super important for, for progress and, and for success. Um, in terms of economics, I mean, Adam Smith explained this in the 1700s that freedom of exchange produces wealth, right? And barriers to peaceful voluntary interaction like tariffs and red tape and flower licensing laws, they, they destroy wealth and, uh, and a bit of our humanity too. And we understand, particularly as libertarians, the harm that economic barriers to human interaction cause. But social barriers are harmful too. So, so remove the barriers and freely interact with all different types of people, regardless of whether they share all of your beliefs or not. And everybody wins. Um, so definitely focus on building relationships and uh, and building yourself. The flip side to this, for um, in terms of applying for your dream job, is uh, the missing piece in chemistry. By missing piece, what I mean is that. Uh, how do you fill the hole that exists within the organization? If the organization is, uh, has a job opening, it's because there's some sort of a hole that exists. And what can you bring that's new and positive to the table? Uh, the last attorney that we hired here at IJ, his, uh, he, he'll be starting soon. He hasn't started yet. But in addition to being a great attorney, he's also a successful entrepreneur. And we don't have, right now, uh, an attorney that's also a successful entrepreneur. So he, he fills that hole. He, he's that missing piece, right? Um, in terms of chemistry, what I mean is, is how well do you mesh with the office? Um, how will you get along with the coworkers and the clients? Uh, how will you build relationships with the people around you at the organization? Every organization that's hiring people wants to find that missing piece and make sure that it has the right chemistry. So keep that in mind when you're out applying for jobs or you know, when you're out uh, trying to sell ideas. In terms of a libertarian future, do we think that a libertarian future is possible? I, uh, I am hopeful. In fact, this is an article from the most recent economist that says the ever-growing state taming Leviathan. 
how to slim the state and become uh, the great political, how slimming the state will become the great political issue of our times. And it's got a quote from Herb Stein here, a famous economist, that says, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. And of course, he's talking about the growth of government. And so I think that in a sense, you know, this libertarian future could be coming perhaps even sooner than we imagine. Uh, and we are making progress. You see this victory for the Louisiana florists. Uh, we're making progress in many areas, free speech and property rights and school choice, and uh, we're making progress all across the country. Uh, and so I think that uh, the future uh, indeed does look bright, particularly with, uh, with the extreme popularity of your group, the Students for Liberty. I'm excited to see what you guys will be doing as things go along. In terms of what to add to your personal library for interacting with people in effective media relations, I would highly recommend these four books. I've actually linked to them all here. Um, well, in the slides, they're linked to Amazon. You probably have Strunk and White from college. Uh, but Zinzer's On Writing Well is absolutely essential for uh, folks who are doing writing. And then the two Carnegie books are just great if you're going to be doing Q, uh, PR or any sort of interacting with people. And I recommend that you read them the way that Carnegie suggests, uh, which is a little different than you read a normal book. In terms of your public library, I recommend picking up the What Colors Your Parachute book, and I think it will help you to uh, land your dream job. For internet suggestions, uh, these are three just outstanding articles that tie into what we're talking about. Henry George uh, is a fascinating guy. He actually wrote Social Problems about 130 years ago, and the conclusion to the book is only four pages long, but it's, uh, it's a wonderful conclusion, and uh, you can read it online. It won't take long, and I think you'll get a kick out of it. Albert J. Nock was a, an eccentric libertarian, and uh, he wrote a famous article called Isaiah's Job. You may have heard of it, but regardless, I recommend reading it. And of course, Leonard Reed, the founder of Fee, wrote, uh, or has a video uh, called How to Advance Liberty. It was one of his most famous talks. He gave it all around the planet, and uh, he actually stole that title from me, but that's okay. And uh, keep in mind, if you watch it, that he was pretty old when it, when it came out, and the video production quality isn't quite, uh, you know, has made progress in the last half century. But I recommend all three of those. So the magic key. Uh, what is the magic key? What is the, uh, the secret formula for converting everyone to become a libertarian, for spreading the gospel of liberty far and wide? What is the magic key? And of course the answer to that is that there is no magic key. What works for me may not work for you or may not work for someone else. Uh, there's no you know, central path to liberty, and there's no uh, one right way to go about um, doing things. And so the key is to try to do a bunch of different things. And, um, and so I recommend that you learn and develop as much as you can and see what works for you and see what works with other people. I actually have a favor to ask you guys, and that is uh, if you can let me know what first prompted you to get interested in libertarianism. And by that I mean what, what, what was it that sold you? Uh, what, what got you sort of on board? And uh, if you could let me know that, that would be appreciated. I'd be curious to hear. Uh, this is my contact info. I actually posted um, this on my Facebook page, and if you, uh, so you could just add a comment if you wanted, or you'd feel free to email me or if for some reason you wanted to text it or something, that'd be fine too. But, uh, but please do let me know. I, I'm really curious to hear what your answer is to that question. And, uh, and I'll just sort of wrap it up here by saying that uh, I encourage you to, uh, to join Team IJ. Uh, sign up for our newsletter. This is, these are all hyperlinked. Uh, join us on Facebook. We've got a great Facebook community. And, uh, and I encourage you to, uh, to become part of our Facebook team and you know, add comments and be a part of it. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or at least check out the videos and how they can benefit you. Uh, and keep us posted. Let us know if you find uh, potential cases that we may want to get involved in, whether it's legally or from our media team or our grassroots activism team, and stay involved. Uh, you know, keep us updated on stuff. Let us know that you know, maybe you're interested in coming out and doing an internship, or, or maybe you're going to law school and you'd like uh, to do a clerkship, or maybe there's some panel going on and you think that IJ can be involved. Uh, we'd, we'd love to, uh, to work more closely with Students for Liberty and to help you guys and to work together. And I think that, uh, that working together, we'd, uh, we can do a good job and advance the cause of liberty and change the world, as we say, and have fun doing it. So with that, I'll say that, uh, that I'm, I'm done with my formal part of my presentation, and I'd be happy to, uh, 
to field any questions or uh, or do my best to at least make up an answer that sounds good. Okay, thank you so much, Bob. Um, we've opened it up to Q&A, so if you have a question, just type it up in the question box over there. Um, our first question is from Suzanne. She says, you mentioned that through influencing public opinion, we can have success. How do you define success? If the Supreme Court has now proven it can take private property, um, and if the private developer can prove he'll make more tax revenue with your property, how do we uh, win, so to speak? So, so I'm, I'm sorry. So, so the question is, if if things are are really bad right now, then how can we how how can we win? Uh, yeah, I, I guess the question is more how do we define success if the Supreme Court has now proven that it can take private property, how do we like go about winning? So yeah. Sure. Well, well, th there's a few answers to that. And, and one of them, of course, is taking the fight to the state legislatures and taking the fight to state courts uh, and then taking the fight to the court of public opinion. And the court of public opinion is extremely powerful. And as I said, there's been all sorts of successes, both in state courts and in uh, in grassroots efforts and in uh, um, in the state legislatures, you know, 43 states did change their laws to to provide greater protection for private property owners against imminent demand abuse. Now, some of them were pretty weak, some of them were really good, but um, but success can be achieved that way. The state courts, the federal government didn't, the Kilo ruling didn't say anything about. Uh, what state courts can do or what the federal legislature can do or what f uh, state legislatures can do. So there's all different ways that we can still do that. Um, we actually, there's two huge eminent domain cases going on right now. We just got done litigating one out in California, which will um, have a big impact throughout California. And uh, our activism um, director, Christina Walsh, has been involved in an imminent domain abuse situation in, uh, in New Jersey. And uh, in largely through the, the grassroots activism efforts, they were able to halt the demolition of, of properties. And so through grassroots work, through working with the media, um, through state courts, state legislatures, we can, uh, we can affect change. Uh, now, how exactly do you determ determine what the success is? I don't know how many properties are seized or you know, what you may do. So I guess that's just a matter of, um, of how you define it. But, but you can, we can definitely increase the protection for property owners. Um, and of course, ideally what we want is the federal court to strike down unconstitutional laws and protect our rights. Okay, great. So our next question is, if applying to a highly com competitive job or internship, is there anything I can do to stand out after I have completed my application? Um, will it seem bad if I stay in touch with the organization after applying, or is that an automatic turnoff to an employer. No, I, I I would recommend doing a doing an immediate uh, follow up thank you letter and actually do a handwritten thank you letter and drop it off in person after your interview. I think that that's the first and best thing you can do right off of the bat. And uh, and yeah, I mean you you want to stay professional and uh, and you know you can follow up after a bit. And the exact length of time, I would actually recommend you know, checking out the recommendation in that book, What Colors Your Parachute, it'll give you recommendations for everything. But, um, but you know, be prepared when you go into the interview and, uh, and you know, stay positive and do all the things that we were discussing. And then after, afterwards, do a follow-up letter and, uh, and I don't know when you'd actually want to contact them. I would, uh, I would actually look for that advice in What Colors Your Parachute or elsewhere uh, and then do what it suggests. Great. Our next question, um, what can we do to counteract the sort of human face study case narrative being used against us? For example, when someone says, if we take away subsidy X, this baby will die. Okay. No, I mean, that's a, that's a good point. And I think that, you know, that gets to uh, just being able to what we want to do is be able to set the terms of debate from the beginning. And so we don't want to be on our back feet. And that's something that, that IJ tries really hard to do is to not be responding to stuff. So if you find yourself responding to stuff, then you know, the best thing you could do is, uh, is, present, 
is present the best case you can. Um, both, you know, getting the research on your side and getting the facts on your side, and you know, personalizing, humanizing, and dramatizing yourself. Um, you know, using the dramatic facts, use the numbers. Um, if if you know there's if the other side is wrong, then you know, show that they're wrong with uh, dramatic numbers and use your own human face uh, stories. And, uh, and you know, depending on what the particular situation is, you can um, get involved in different ways. But you know, I'd recommend uh, you know interact having if, when you have people in the in the media world that you can rely on to help get get your sort of numbers and human stories out. And when you can counteract in the court of public opinion, when you can point to research and you can eloquently describe your position, uh, then that will help to increase the chance that you're successful. Like I was talking about with the building yourself, when you can really accurately and beautifully describe your situation, then you can help to sway other people. Okay, just um, another one is, should I list my political affiliations on my resume, or should my resume be politically neutral? When is it appropriate for me to broadcast my views? Well, I think it depends on what sort of uh, work that you've done uh, in the past. I mean, if you've worked at, you know, four libertarian outfits, it's you know going to be pretty obvious what your leanings are. But I, I don't think you need to, you know, have it look like a Facebook page where it says, you know, here's my status and here's my religious beliefs and political beliefs. I don't think you need to affirmatively say what they are. But if your resume happens to reflect it, then that's nothing that you should hide. Okay, let's see if there's another one. Um, so someone says, my loved one is very opinionated and likes to get out his message, but he tends to go on for too long and then he gets angry when people get turned off. What do you recommend as a nice way to tell a loved one about Socos? Uh, okay, Socos. Socos, uh, let's see. sorry. So, so what I recommend is, uh, is taking a soft approach. Um, you have to understand that that not everyone is going to agree with you, and that's just the way that the world works. And I think that it's much better to to find points of agreement and sort of enjoy them than to sit and fight about stuff that we disagree with, and um, and to just openly share ideas and to try to see things from their from their point of view. Um, they, they may have good reasons for believing what they do, but uh, I, I don't think that you want to try to bang your views over anyone's head, particularly if they're you know someone that you're in a close relationship with. That that probably won't lead to anything good. But um, but maybe you know maybe you'll both end up teaching each other some stuff. Okay, thanks, Bob. I think we have one more question. Just one second. Okay. How much do you think aesthetic appeal of something like a PowerPoint matters when we present to people? Do you think having a professional look is very important or only slightly important to us being effective communicators or uh, being taken seriously? Do you have any tips for how to approach creating presentations? Sure, I think that's a good question, and I would say that uh, generally, I am opposed to present uh, PowerPoint presentations. I don't think that um, that they're the way to do things. Uh, now, if you're doing a webinar, of course, then the web webinar uh, benefits, you know, because because we're not face to face. I think face to face is always the best. So, if you're giving a presentation to a group and they're in front of you, I personally don't like PowerPoint presentations. I think that they tend to be a little more boring and you know tend to use them as a crutch. Uh, it's better to be engaged with the audience and to be interactive and to talk to them. I, I think that it's okay to show them a couple of videos, but um, one of the problems with PowerPoint is that people read a lot faster than they talk. And so um, you know people, the audience and the speaker tend to be a little disconnected. So I like to not use a PowerPoint presentation, you know, unless it's something like a webinar. And you know the webinars are great because uh, you know, we can't all get together all the time. But if you have the opportunity to be face to face, then I definitely recommend um, just being being engaged with the audience and uh, and just you know 
delivering it uh, just sort of from the heart. Um, in terms of you know how important the the aesthetics are to something, I think that uh, it depends. If if you're face to face, I think that the best thing you could do is be able to just communicate face to face, uh, just speaking and interacting with each other. If you're sending something out like a video, uh, if you're making a video that you're you know pitching to bloggers, then I think that uh, the aesthetics are extremely important. And having a video that looks professional goes a much longer way. And having a, a video that really grabs you, you know, the whole humanizing and dramatizing really, uh, really has a big impact. So, um, so yeah, so if you get a chance to do a face-to-face -face talk, I think that's the best. But still, you know, graphs and visuals are good. But, you know, just having all of your words up, you know, reading off the slides and having bullet points are not as effective as, uh, as just, uh, as just lecturing and interacting with the audience. And we have one last question. What led you to libertarianism? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, it was actually an interesting story. I, uh, I, in college, I started getting interested in politics, and I had no idea what I was. I really didn't know anything about it. And I came across this now defunct party called the Natural Law Party. And um, I didn't realize it, but they were basically a front for transcendental meditation. But um, anyways, I got kind of interested in them. And I went to an event. I was in Toledo, Ohio. And there were a bunch of third party political candidates running for mayor. And they had a press conference. And there were no press there, because they were all third party candidates. And they were all talking, the natural law guy, and the green guy, and the reform guy. And then the libertarian guy went up. And I'd never heard of a libertarian before. And when the guy started talking, I just thought, oh my god. He just totally resonated with me. And so I, I looked over the guy I went with, and I said, what's a libertarian? And he said, oh, basically, they're an anarchist. And, uh, and so that was my introduction. But he planted the seed in my head. And so I started going in and doing research, and I found uh, this cranky old uh, congressman down in Texas named Ron Paul. And this was way before the Ron Paul revolution. And I started reading his articles and um, getting really interested in what he was saying. And then I actually went out and listened to him talk in Indiana. And before he went on stage, I asked him how he learned so much about economics, being a doctor. And he looked at me and said, the foundation for economic education. And so then I started doing research on fee. And when, uh, you know, then when I, my brother encouraged me to apply for a, like my dream job, I applied at fee. And, uh, and that's how I sort of ended up at fee. And once I got there, it really transformed for me. You know, to the extent that you can immerse yourself in an environment that you love, I absolutely recommend it, even if you're interning, even if you know, you've know you already graduated. like Go find a place where you can immerse yourself in a place that you love, and you'll absolutely benefit from it. Um, incidentally, the first speaker I picked up at Fee, uh, my first month there, was Ron Paul. And so I drove him back from the airport, and I had no idea how to get there, so I got lost. And he said to me in the van, he said, so how'd you hear about Fee? And I said, well, you. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so the first sort of bug was planted by this uh, guy who ran for uh, mayor as a libertarian. I have no idea who he is. I don't even remember what he said, but uh, he planted a seed and then uh, it sort of grew from there. Okay, great. Well, that's all we have for the evening. Thank you so much, Bob, and all of our participants. I hope you can all continue coming back to our webinars to learn more throughout the year. Our next webinar is um, next Wednesday, March 30th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Members of the SFL Executive Board will be discussing leadership on campus and taking your questions and suggestions about our programs. To register, visit our website, studentsforliberty.org. On a final note, shortly you will be emailed a follow-up email where you will receive a survey to evaluate the webinar. Please take a couple of minutes to fill it out. It helps us know how to improve our program and make these webinars more interesting for you. And with that, I think we are officially wrapped up. Thank you again for your time this evening, and we um, have a wonderful night, everyone.